Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Spike Milligan. Yes, I'm afraid it's, it's me. Uh, it was this or a uh, Bob Monkhouse repeat. <laughs> For your information, I am three hours ahead of English summertime. So if you want to set your watches, you'll be able to see me leaving as you're all coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't organized anything this evening, so nothing can go wrong. <laughs> I want you to cast your minds back now. September the 3rd, 1939. The last minutes of peace were ticking away, and my father and I and my brother watching my mother digging an air raid shelter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's a great little woman, said father. And getting smaller all the time. <laughs> Just then, a man called Neville Chamberlain who did Prime Minister impressions. <laughs> he spoke on the wireless, and he said, We have not heard from Mr. Hitler. So as from 11 o'clock today, we are at war with Germany. And love that we <laughs> Spontaneous bursts of applause. <laughs> it was a great day for the Milligan family when two military policemen dragged me screaming from the house, <laughs> took me to Victoria Station and put me on the train for Bex Hill, which I was to discover was an above-ground cemetery. <laughs> they didn't bury the dead there. And put them on street duties. <laughs> At Bexhill, I got out. It wasn't easy. The train didn't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped off, and I was catapulted to the feet of a sergeant major with a face like Tommy Cooper's upside down. <laughs> he, he screwed up his eyes, teeth and ears and said to me, you are not Minigan, are you? Now, I could have given him one of a thousand names like a bloody fool. I said, yes. <laughs> All right then. Well then. <laughs> to the headquarters. Attention, kick, right, left, left. I said, yes. I said, wait a minute, what about the other leg? <laughs> I didn't want to join a one-legged regiment. And I've got nothing against one-legged soldiers, but then neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> I was marched into a battery office which contained a table on which were three paper clips. 
On the wall was a picture of a woman with big tits. <laughs> Captioned, join the Navy and see the world. <laughs> then, <laughs> an officer wearing a World War II uniform over a World War I body. <laughs> He spoke, uh, what your name, my man? I said, Spike Milligan, sir. Silence when you speak to an officer, <laughs> said the sergeant. Now, Milligan, now, where are you from? London, sir. Uh, which part? All of me. <laughs> The first thing you find out in the matters of the army is food. <laughs> At mealtimes, there was a duty officer present who was informed what the dish of the day was. In this case, it was sausages. The cook called out, duty officer present, eat to your attention. And the officer came walking past and said, any complaints? The gunner next to me said, me, sir, no, what have you got? The gunner said, I've got piles. <laughs> That's funny, said the officer, everybody else has got sausages. <laughs> next, I had to go to the M.O. Take your clothes off, he said. Oh, don't you want to take me out to dinner or <laughs> How long has it been like that? I said, that's as long as it's ever been. small dance band and played the trumpet. At one dance, a soldier came up to me and ripped open his battle dress jacket, pointed to a wound and said, Dunkirk! So I lowered my trousers <laughs> and showed him my appendicitis scar and I said, Lucian General Hospital! <laughs> uh, I remember, remember once we were playing at a dance. A rather well-dressed officer came up to me and said, Look, uh, uh, Bombardier, it's my wife and I first anniversary. Do you play requests? I said, Yes. What would you like? He said, Oh, uh, anything. <laughs> Before, <laughs> before long, we went overseas at the request of the women of Bexhill. <laughs> couldn't stand the pressure any longer. We went on board the SS Otranto, a sturdy ship with a slight tendency to sink. <laughs> and we wondered why the crew all slept in the lifeboats. <laughs> anyway, the first day in action, Gunner Shapiro and I were detailed to run a telephone wire up a hill to an OP. OP. We got about halfway up and suddenly mortars commenced and we, as we got nearer the top, increased in density. After one particularly loud blast, Shapiro turned to me and said, are we insured against this sort of thing? <laughs> we were gradually winning the war. And I had to take a, a Lieutenant Bowman Smythe and his pipe in my Bren carrier to look for a new OP. And as we drove along, we came to an area that seemed remarkably quiet, very uncomfortable. The Lieutenant and his pipe got out and started looking at his maps to fix a new position. I heard something behind me. I turned around and there were three German paratroopers standing with their hands up. 
the Burmans might have said, what's going on there? I said, there are three German paratroopers here, sir. He said, well, ask them what they want. <laughs> I said they, they want to become prisoners of war, sir. But well, tell them we haven't got the facility. <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm sorry, sir, I, I don't speak German. He said, come here, take these maps. He, he went over these German paratroopers and went as like chickens. He went, choo! <laughs> Well, now you know how the war took so long for us. <laughs> One day, we were told to withdraw as German troops were infiltrating in the night. I went out to return to the gun position, which had all the guns on their way out across the fields. And with the, all that was left for me was this Bren carrier. So I threw my stuff on it. I turned around and on the hill behind me, there was what appeared to be American helmets. So I shouted, don't shoot, British. Whereupon there was an absolute storm of firing. <laughs> there were German paratroopers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll stop the show here a while because Apropos of that occasion, uh, as a German who came over here during the war was take, taken prisoner, his name is Hans Tesk, and he read one of my war books, and uh, he suddenly realized that he had been one of these paratroopers <laughs> shooting at me. So he wrote to me and told me, and I thought, I must take him out to lunch, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> And we had a, a wonderful lunch like this, and at the end of it, I said, look, Hans, you must autograph my menu. He said, of course, Spike. And he said, dear Spike, sorry I missed you on February <laughs> the 10th. <laughs> Would you like to stand up, Hans? Oh, there, there he is. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> when, when victory came in Tunis, we were given a, a week's leave in Tunis under Sergeant Bullock. And he took us through the streets in Tunis and said, you should, you, you should stick with me. And uh, I will find you a very good restaurant. <laughs> and we were pretty naive. We said, oh, all right, so it's fine. So we, we came to one. He said, this one here is good ones. He said, how do you know that? See, he's got knives and forks on the table. <laughs> so we all, we all went inside. We all went inside. And he said to the waiter, Earths, Havoc chips, cat, tom. <laughs> the waiter said, it's all right that I speak English. <laughs> Would you like any particular wine? He said, yes. Yes, any particular wine. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, uh, I lost a dear friend, Jack Hobbs. I looked everywhere for him. <laughs> <laughs> he is the the subject of this next story. He went to Cyprus for his holidays, and whilst he was out there, he basically got the shits. <laughs> <laughs> when he got back to London, I went to work on a Monday, he still got them. And they were pretty bad, and he thought, good heavens, I can't wait to go home in the, the rush hour with the shits like this. <laughs> they would get an earlier train. So he went to, started to walk towards the station, and he did something for him which was fatal. He coughed. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so he tried, he went into a manswear shop and said, look, can you make a pair of un uh, underpants, 39 size, and inside leg long trousers, that, never mind what colour they are. <laughs> so he, he went outside because the aroma around him was pretty heavy. <laughs> and he went back in and he finally got the chap gave him the goods in the plastic bag. And when he got to the station, he realised that uh, uh, it was quite late and the train was full. And so was he. <laughs> <laughs> so he got in on the train, he got into the toilet uh, and locked the door. And he started to sport himself with these awful trousers and underpants. And he threw them out that little window <laughs> at the top of them. And I think of the poor blokes on the line. <laughs> So then he, he opened, the, he opened his, his plastic bag and all there was in it was a lady's pink sweater. <laughs> well, he was, he was getting pretty near to his station. So he had to do something. So he turned this lady's sweater upside down and he pulled his legs. To, and pull the body up over him like this. And then suddenly he realized where the neck was. <laughs> so he, he was not dispirited. He took his tubey hat off. <laughs> and he tucked it inside the brim, all inside like so that it looked like a giant hernia. <laughs> Well, that, in essence, is the end of the story. <laughs> Except that when he got out uh, at, at Kingsway, uh, he noticed that English people will not say what is they can see. Everyone there knew him and ignored him in this terrible state. <laughs> All except the ticket collector and said, Hello, Mr. Hobbs, you've been on your holidays. <laughs>
And after the war, I wrote the goons and apparently died. Priscilla's <laughs> has who since died. He had a, a flat opposite me. And one morning at 3 a.m., the doorbell rang, and I went to see who it was. And there stood Peter Sellers, stark naked, except for a trilby hat and shoes. He said, uh, do you know a good tailor? <laughs> In return, I sent him a telegram. Uh, ignore first telegram. <laughs> Peters was a, a motor freak. In the early hours one morning during Christmas week, he phoned me and said, come around right away. I thought maybe he was changing wives. <laughs> so I, anyhow, I put on my overcoat over my pajamas, jumped in my mini, and when I got to his place, he was sitting in a Rolls Royce, and he says, I says, what is it, Peter? He said, look, Spike, this is a brand new Rolls Royce. It's a disgrace. It's got a squeak in the boot. I can't hear it in the daytime when I'm driving in traffic, but at night I can hear it clearly. I said, you could tell me that on the phone. <laughs> yes, he said, so I could have. Well, what do you want me to do about it? He said, oh, if I'm driving this along, bumping the curb, you will be able to hear it. He said, I want you to take this piece of chalk <laughs> and torch, get in the boot. <laughs> when you hear a squeak, put a little cross where there is. <laughs> so I, I got in and he drove off. I was making these little white crosses. <laughs> when I heard a, a motor car pull up, it was police. And the police stopped him and they breathalyzed him. <laughs> then there was a crunch of boots in my direction. <laughs> finally, uh, somebody opened the boots. And a torch shined on me. <laughs> and the boy said, oh, it's you. <laughs> uh, then I decided to rewrite the Bible. <laughs> and I suddenly became the Salman Rushdie of the Catholic faith. <laughs> and I heard that the Pope had, uh, had uh, put a fatwa out on me. <laughs> And now I'm going to read you the first page. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This was due to a malfunction at Lots Road Power Station. <laughs> and God said, let there be light. And there was light. But Eastern Electricity Board said, they would have to wait until Tuesday to connect it. <laughs> and God saw the light, and it was good. And he saw the quarterly bill, and that was not good. <laughs> and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And so passed his GCSE. <laughs> and God said, let there be a firmament. And God called the firmament heaven free phone 999. <laughs> and God said, let the waters be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And in London, it went on the market at 600 pounds a square foot. <laughs> and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And the earth brought forth grass. And lo, the Rastafarians smoked it. Spike! It is I. It shot us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I came to see you when you were in hospital. You'd had the operation, and about two days after, you weren't feeling all that well. I came in to I see you. I was dying for you. You were. <laughs> you never feel well when you're dying. You didn't look too good. Anyway, 
I was lying face down most of the time. <laughs> You're on your back, I tell you. And you have this sort of transparent oxygen mask over your face, and you're muttering away. So I just held your hand. I couldn't, and your, your eyes are fixed He's over looking, my shoulder on some for, distant horizon. <laughs> and I thought, you're going to pop your clogs. I really did. And then after a while, oh, my neck got look, stiff. Stop this, stop this. What? How do you pop clogs? <laughs> I mean, you have to the go to the shop. <laughs> have you ever seen anybody popping clogs? Yeah. <laughs> Only wise. <laughs> anyway, I'm nearly finished. I'm, so, I'm ruining you. I'm You've sorry. You've done it already. Anyway, I started, started again. I'm used to it. Yeah. You were looking in the distance, and I thought you were going to turn your cards in. Well, that's all I could afford that's at the it. time. So after a while, I held your hand, then I put it down. I looked over my shoulder, and I found you watching a television set <laughs> with the sound off. So what was the program you were watching? I'd been studying Braille. <laughs> and I had a Braille card in the bed with me. I watched the whole of uh, Coronation Street in Braille. <laughs> Thank you. It's the best. It's the best, it's the best it ever sounded to me. So like in your fairly long life, which has given so much pleasure. What was your most enjoyable moment? Her name was Lily Gallagher. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Sounds reasonable to me. <laughs> Lindsay is small. <laughs> um, apart from your socks and maybe your underwear, is there anything you'd like to change about yourself? Uh. I wouldn't change your hair. <laughs> I'd like to change my bank manager. <laughs> For good. <laughs> I wrote up there and I said, uh, they wrote to me, they said, Mr. Million, they're overdrawn 710 pounds. Would you see, please see to it? I don't want you to see to it. What do you do? So I wrote back and said, thank you very much for reminding me how much I owe you. Spike Million. <laughs> there was a long silence. And then they wrote again, dear Mr. Million, did you get our letter of so and of the 3rd of April. So I said, listen, uh, I, once a month, uh, all my creditors, I write their names on a piece of paper and I drop them in, in a hat and I draw one out and I pay it. And if you don't stop bothering me, I won't put your bloody name in there. <laughs> I used to come and watch the Goon Show at Camden in 1953. And since then, I've often wondered, who were your heroes? Who inspired you as a humorist and a writer? Marx Brothers. Did you ever get to meet any of them? No, yes, I did. I went down to a male toilet. <laughs> and he was there. And he said, what are you doing in my dressing room? <laughs> And uh, it's, well, well, some of the gags from the Marx Brothers, there's that wonderful one where Groucho was playing the guitar to Margaret Dupont, who never, under never understood what she was doing in his film. And he's saying, I love you, I always will. Suddenly there's a knock on the door and says, Oh, it's my, it's my husband. So Groucho says, What will I do? She said, Duck behind the couch. So he went behind the couch, and the husband came in. And Gasha stood up and said, there's no duck behind this guy. <laughs> Spike, can I ask you a question? Um, you, you managed to dismiss the whole of the goon show in one sentence, and you paid even less attention to another aspect of your career, I can remember when you gave me the worst evening in the theatre that I've ever had. It was in the middle 60s, and you were starring in the West End in a play called Oblomov, Son of Oblomov, wasn't it? So, yes, I Son of the Father. Yeah. I was doing the same. <laughs> <laughs> in which you ad-libbed your part every night, and every night it was different. 
And the night I came, you decided to keep putting the house lights up. <laughs> and you noticed me. And from then on, about every 10 minutes, you would stop, say, put the house lights up. And then you would say, Dennis, you're a writer. What's the next line? <laughs> <laughs> The play, it was an enormous success and ran for ages, but how did the rest of the cast cope with you? They left. <laughs> but did you, did you ever one get... One by ones and two, they didn't all leave at once. <laughs> and they never left in the middle of an act. I'd say, I've had enough of you. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever get stuck, though, for, a, for an idol? Never. That's, no. that, that was, uh, yeah. I was just... Just brilliant. <laughs> Next, please. Mr. Mike. Yes. Could you describe your worst date ever? This could be it. Uh... <laughs> Oh, I'd like, I'd like to introduce you to Judd Proctor. <laughs> <laughs> Judd is, is a composer. He's written 300 tunes. All crap. <laughs> He always just missed writing a winner. <laughs> like he wrote, I like New York in August. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the lady is a trampolinist. <laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> I've become accustomed to your face flannel. <laughs> Jesus Christ, superintendent. Uh, we're going to sing a, one of the late Alan Clare's songs, which I set t t words to. It's called Small Love Song. It was summer On the lake hung a golden haze it was summer, it was one of those endless days And we walked through a field of clover And then over a sheep spun hill And it seemed it would last forever And it did until came the evening we swung on the garden gate It was heaven You were seven and I was eight And we looked at the stars suspended Walking home down an apple lane Me and Dolly A doll and a daisy On an evening that would never come going to read some of William Shakespeare's verse. And then I thought, why should I? <laughs> he never reads any of mine. <laughs> this is a garden fairy. This is a, a true story. There was a little girl. She was watching her father. He was taking rocks from the garden and dumping them in the river. 
Her mother called, what's daddy doing? He's trying to make the garden lighter. <laughs> the kids are magic, and uh, I collected all their stories. I had one when I was mowing the garden one evening, and I had to use the outside loo. When I was in there, there was a knock on the door. I said, who's there? This voice said, it's somebody else. <laughs> This is a poem I wrote to my boyhood dog. Boxer, my boxer, where do you lie? Somewhere under a Pune sky. Ah, my canine total joy. You were to me when as a boy we coursed the wind and ran the wild. No end in sight, mile after mile. I was to you and you to me locked in a bond eternally. They never told me when you died to spare me pain in case I cried. So then, to those adult fears, denied you then my childhood tears. This is one I wrote. Hold on. Oh. Don't start that, we'll be here all night. <laughs> this is the butterfly. This evening, in the twilight's gloom, a butterfly flew in my room. Oh, what beauty, oh, what grace, who needs visitors from out of space? <laughs> I say you're taking this awfully well. <laughs> this is a death wish. Bury me anywhere, somewhere near a tree. Some place where a horse will graze and gallop over me. Bury me somewhere near a stream. When she floods her banks, I'll give her thanks for reaching out to me. So bury me, bury me in my childhood scene. But please don't burn me in Golders Green. <laughs> This is a long one, but I like it. Help, help, said the man. I'm drowning. Hang on, said the man from the shore. Help, help, said the man. I'm not drowning. Yes, I know, and I heard you before. <laughs> Be a patient, dear man, who is drowning. You see, I've got a disease. I'm waiting for a Dr. Browning. So do be patient, please. How long, said the man who was drowning, will it take for him to arrive? Not very long, said the man with the disease. Till then, try staying alive. <laughs> very well, said the man who was drowning. I'll try and stay afloat by reciting the poems of Browning and other things he wrote. <laughs> help, help, said the man who had a disease. I suddenly feel quite ill. Keep calm, said the man who was drowning. Breathe deeply and lay quite still. Oh dear, said the man with the awful disease. I think I'm going to die. Farewell, said the man who was drowning. Said the man with disease, goodbye. So the man who was drowning drowned, and the man with disease passed away. But apart from that and a fire in my hat, it's been a very nice day. <laughs> the hills are alive. Climb every mountain. Ford every stream. Follow every rainbow till you're knackered. <laughs> If, if you're attacked, if you're attacked by a lion, 
try fresh underpants to try on. <laughs> Lie on the ground, keep quite still, pretend that you are very ill. Keep like that, day after day, perhaps the lion will go away. <laughs> My name is Fred Fanakapan. I walk around the town. Sometimes with my trousers up, and sometimes with them down. And when they were up, they were up. And when they were down, they were down. And when they were only halfway up, I was arrested. <laughs> we have cracked the midnight glass and loosed the racketing star-crazed night into the room. The blind harp sings in the late firelight, and your hand is decked with white promises. What wine is this? There are squirrels chasing in my glass. Good God, I'm pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I saw Jesus on a tram. I said to you, Jesus, he said, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> I have a nanny, six foot three. She really was the death of me. Through the roaring traffic, she'd push my pram. Down my throat, my food she ran. She made it, it made her ecstatically happy to never ever change my nappy. So it shouldn't surprise you all a bit that I grew up a bit of a shit. <laughs> Called Prince Charles a groveling little bastard. How did you stand get up when you say that? <laughs> <laughs> I was in the room when you called Prince Charles a groveling little bastard, but so was I. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how did you get to know him so well? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have no idea. I, I don't know whether I do know him so well anymore. <laughs> and then the next day, I send him a telegram saying. I suppose a knight would have the question. <laughs> Barbara Kelly. Spite, darling. Um, as Charlie? A, oh. Uh, as, as a Kelly from Donegal, um, I'd, I'd like to know what you find different or better between the Irish and the British. Or the, the well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. My sister and I went to stay at a castle in... Uh, Ireland, and we stopped on the way there in a little tiny cow town, and it's just a little side turning like this. Pull up the mini, and she went into this tea room to get some more tea in a thermos. I noticed that the, it was at the time of the rocket to the moon, and somebody had cut out on a big piece of cardboard a rocket, and written, the rocket tea room. <laughs> Stuck up there. And there was a green bulb and a red bulb going on and over the chain. <laughs> when I looked into the shop, it was a bloke behind the counter who was working there. <laughs> yes. Remember the time I borrowed your overcoat? Yes. Oh. Linden Gardens. That's right, you it was raining. And a pre-war overcoat with huge shoulders. And it hung below your heels, remember that, yes. <laughs> Years after the Goo Show, he was touring somewhere. I went and saw him, and I just happened to say to him, what, 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 did you, what happened to that overcoat that I gave you? And he said, I sold it! <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to see you. And you too, my dear. Thanks for a marvellous evening tonight. It's been absolutely great. Um, the, in the Goon Shows, the characters in the Goon Show, um, were they all picked out of your own imagination or were some of them based on real people? Uh, Blue Bottom was based upon uh, a tall, 12 foot high uh, boy scout. <laughs> <laughs> With a, oh, the half boy like that. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a, and uh, Blood Knock was the, used to be the major 
the quartermaster in Pune stores who used to knock off the, the goods uh, and then the wives. <laughs> Spike? Yeah? Um, how is Plunger Bailey? Plunger Bailey? <laughs> Plunger Bailey. He died. Oh. He and his enormous weapon. <laughs> Plunger Bailey was a man who we first saw in the shower at Bexhill. He had this enormous tool. <laughs> it hung below his knee. And uh, when we went to Africa, he was excused short. <laughs> and we used to wonder why all the women used to wait for men in long trousers. <laughs> Yes. From any century, male or female, who would you most like to take out to dinner and why? Jesus. And why? Love to see him. <laughs> <laughs> would you ask him to turn water into wine again? Yeah. I'd like uh, uh, a Gewurztraminer. <laughs> Bondi Tadiv, 1979. <laughs> do you think he could do it? <laughs> well, he better. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. I'd be very glad to see you going. Thank you. <laughs>